And what I want to do is I talk, talk about the kind of theory behind this. Why, why do I want to call, go through the theory before I show you some of the practical things I've done? And um, Because I think it's really, really useful for teachers to locate themselves where they are theoretically with Shakespeare. And Shakespeare is quite tricky because the two sides to dealing with Shakespeare, you have to first of all, as a teacher, deal with the literary criticism of Shakespeare, okay, how he's been interpreted by um, a, a, a tradition of academics that goes back three, four hundred years, you know, um, and then secondly, you have to then deal with the pedagogical tradition, the tradition of teaching Shakespeare. So there's two things, and it's quite difficult to deal with those things. Um, and getting clear in your head where you stand in these debates can really help you inform your teaching. Um, let's look at the old tradition of teaching Shakespeare. I think this is really important, particularly in the context of Michael Gove and the new curriculum. He used to be treated very reverentially, and I'm certain this is where Gove, and I, don't, I know Gove, uh, I've met and talked to Gove and Nick Gibb, and I'm certain that the, this is the way they would like Shakespeare to be taught. Um, that Shakespeare is part of the canon, and that he should be taught in a very reverential way. Um, and if you look, there's a noble tradition of critics who've, done, who've looked at Shakespeare. This A.C. Bradley famously uh, shows that the tragedies are timeless, that the lessons of Hamlet will be uh, for, forever. And, and F.R. Leavis follows on from Bradley and does this. And then you've got people like Toby Young, who set up the new free school, who promote these sorts of views. And I've had a vicious row with him over uh, various things in which you can follow um, in the Telegraph and that kind of thing. And then real education, a campaign for real education very much would pro possibly be opposed to some of the things Ellie and I are saying. Um, they would say start with the text, start reading it through in the traditional way. And then we've got the more creative um, uh, uh, versions of teaching Shakespeare, which have been around for about 30, 40 years. Um, and Nate has been an absolute uh, pathfinder in this. And, and they have produced a very nice booklet, which is on sale, I'm sure, downstairs, um, that uh, is really useful and valuable resource. Um, so it enters the knowledge versus skills debate. What are you actually teaching in Shakespeare? Are you going to teach the knowledge of the language, uh, or are you going to teach the skill of decoding it? Okay, so are you going to teach um, the actual core knowledge that uh, is in the plays, the characters, the plots, the themes, or are you going to teach the children the skills to deal with difficult language? Um, and it's also fascinatingly entered the British values debate, which has happened in the Trojan horse sort of thing. So, uh, where schools, Shakespeare is. Um, really becoming a, a locus, a place where we argue that he teaches English values. Um, and I'll talk about this in a minute. This is really interesting. So why, why Shakespeare? I think st students need to know what's in it for me. Why are they actually doing it? So if you're clear about why you're going to be teaching it, you can then start replying to something, why I'm doing this really boring stuff. Okay, um, so it's really useful to get clear on your arguments. Um, they find it more engaging, I found, when they know why they're doing this, the Bard. Um, and it's worth exploring with them why they might be doing Shakespeare and why you might want to study Shakespeare. I think it's a, it's a, it's a worthy topic, a uh, starter activity for any uh, beginning of a Shakespeare unit. Even if they've done it before, revisiting us now, I'm sure we could have a really interesting conversation about why we want to study Shakespeare. Um, so we've got to locate them in a theoretical framework. Right. I am fascinated, the more I look into this, about the different approaches. Um, Robert Eagleston, uh, an, a fantastic literary critic, one of the best there is, divides the study of Shakespeare in his book, Doing English, into two different approaches. Now, I probably disagree with him here, but this is what Eagleston says. Eagleston says that there's the traditionalist approach, which we'll look at in a minute, the new historicist approach. And we're going to look at both of those in a minute and what they involve. Um, 
I would argue there's also the really powerful drama-led approach, which Rex Gibson and the Cambridge School's Shakespeare Project has developed over the last 30, 40 years, and, he, and, and with the Nate approach, the Shakespearean, uh, the, which I think is a, a, an approach in itself as well, um, which is slightly different from uh, Gibson's. Um, and then there's the Shakespeare, our contemporary approach, which has a long and noble tradition in the theatre. Um, Jan Kott, uh, a, a Polish theatre director, developed the idea that, you know, we need to write, get these plays and, and show them in contemporary settings. Also, Paulo Freire, a, a, a Brazilian sort of um, philosopher of education, has quite a bit to say on this as well, but I'll talk about this. Okay, let's look at the traditional approach. Eagleston says that there are three main reasons why a traditional English teacher, possibly from the older generation, but certainly people like Ingl uh, Michael Gove, um, who was, did English at um, Cambridge, would say you do Shakespeare. Firstly, the artistic, aesthetic worth of the place. They are the great plays the greatest pieces of literature that ever have been written. Okay, that's one argument. Secondly, these people argue that, that Shakespeare teaches us values that are um, moral values that improve us. This argument goes right back to a, a thinker called Matthew Arnold, who wrote a book in the Victorian time called Culture and Anarchy, which looks at how um, certain great pieces of literature make us better people. Okay. And then there is the universal appeal of the Shakespeare's, that these are timeless characters, they are timeless themes, and they cross all cultures, and they cross uh, all ages, okay? That somehow these plays have this kind of mystical, almost mystical value. Um, how would you teach Romeo and Juliet if you're a traditionalist? That's a quick question. Anyone, any thoughts on this? If you're a traditional teacher, how would you teach it? Anyone got any thoughts on that one? Um, I've got to confess, this is how I first taught Romeo and Juliet when I first started teaching in Tower Hamlets, um, having been educated at university in a kind of quite a traditional Shakespeare course. It wasn't a traditional university, but and I the way I did it was I tried to read it round the class and explain the language and um, talk about how the characters were timeless characters and get them to do uh, plot summaries and to do literary criticism. It failed miserably. I mean, it didn't work and it it involved a, a high level of stress because you know students weren't following it. It was just going over their head. So um, I, I have sort of changed my opinions on on how to teach that. Um, I think that probably is how a traditionalist would teach uh, many of the texts to start with the text itself. Yeah, yeah I just I, I was talking to an English PGC lecturer who interviewed someone who clearly came from the traditionalist school because when asked that question where they'd start with the Shakespeare play said they start by drawing the distinction between thee and thou. Yeah, well, actually I talk about that here yeah. in a minute. It's about quite interesting, they start... Teaching the, language, the cases. The cases yes. and the, the, the grammar, yeah, which is really interesting, isn't it? Um, so, uh, you know, it, 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 the traditionalist argues, you will say it's the greatest love story ever, ever told, okay? It is showing you love triumphs overall. It teaches you invaluable lessons about love and hate and feuding. Okay, that it morally teaching shape, uh, Romeo and Juliet makes us a better person. Okay, we come out of it a better person, and you know, as Eagleston um, and that this love story has an appeal across all cultures. Okay, and Eagleston says, interesting, you know, for traditionalists, Shakespeare's plays are like a star, beautiful, remote, independent of Earth and worldly concerns to be wondered at and admired, okay? So that will be the approach that would happen in that. Now, possibly with certain classes that are very well behaved and possibly who have a huge cultural knowledge already, um, they, th this approach it could be valid and might work. Um, the new historicist cultural materials approach is a very exciting um, new kind of critical approach uh, pioneered by a um, literary critic called Stephen Greenblatt um, in the uh, 1980s. And, 
uh, it will start to look at the text. And this is a literary criticism approach. This is not a teaching approach, by the way. I'm going to talk about teaching approaches in a minute. This is, but I think it's useful to know this stuff so it's in the back of your head. Um, so a, a cultural materialist will look at the way in which perhaps women and gender are uh, approached. They will look at the context in which these texts have arisen. So they will look really closely at the political ideologies that generated these texts. They will look at the theatrical context. And that some of the most exciting Shakespeare scholarship has been in this field, where people have looked really closely at where, what world did this Shakespeare, these Shakespeare texts emerge from? And so they're emerging history, they're emerging literary criticism, cultural studies, um, to create some really fascinating uh, texts. And they will also look at the context of reading, how we ourselves view Shakespeare, what we're bringing to the texts. Okay? So um, they'll be typically looking at social class, gender, um, eth the role of ethnicity um, in Shakespeare. And they will look really closely at the language too, but from a different standpoint from the traditionalist. Okay, who The traditionalist might be saying that this is beautiful poetry, whereas the cultural materialist will be saying, what sorts of attitudes lurk behind this language? Okay? Um, so just the and thou is a particularly interesting one. David Crystal, in his book Shakespeare's Words, looks really closely at the ways in which thee and thou work in, in Shakespeare. Uh, because initially, in Old English, thou is a singular and you is a plural. Um, but, as, as it, uh, but by Shakespeare's time, um, the French way of talking, where vous is used to indicate you in the plural, um, there would be a, a situation where you would be used in the singular okay, to indicate a change of relationship to indicate that you might be showing that you're a social equal of someone. So it's actually quite a good task to look at the way the and thou is used. Um, and that's something I did in Romeo and Juliet. Uh, I'm working on a study guide for Romeo and Juliet at the moment. And it really is interesting. You know, uh, I'll just quickly go through one thing. Lady Capulet in Act 1, Scene 3 addresses the nurse as thou and thee. Etc. But both Juliet and the nurse say you about her. So we can see that um, she's much more familiar with them. She's of a higher social status than them, and they have to respond by using thee and thou to show that they're lower down the pecking order. Um, and so looking at thee and thou can be a quite a, a really interesting thing to do. Um, so what activities might they do? Well, they will be looking, they will, you will be sending people and researching the social context to Shakespeare and looking at the times. Now, there's a lot of resources on this on the internet. Uh, the best one is a fantastic program called Shakespeare's Restless World. Has anyone come across this? Fantastic, absolutely brilliant. Neil McGregor in the uh, British Library. Um, takes objects from Shakespeare's time and he's got some of the world experts. It's all online, it's all free, it's yeah. a podcast. British, British Museum, <laughs> sorry. Oh, thank you. Thank you. Um, all online, all free, really, really good and quite understandable for um, older children. Uh, so this is the sort of thing, you know, cultural materialists will look at how the presentation of Juliet, what it tells us about the treatment of women, you know, Yes. Sorry to interject. Yeah. Suddenly, being very aware that I am now a cultural, cultural materialist, um, I taught a lesson. What day are we today? Friday. Wednesday's lesson before I came here, um, where the students came in and I was dressed up as a Jacobean woman, as best as you can with a paper ruffle, um, and I gave all the girls were sat at the back and they were given sheets of music um, and a dance to learn, and all the boys at the front were given kind of science. Um, and then we kind of mind mapped, okay, how are you feeling? And I curtsied to all the boys when they came in, and they were allowed to talk, but the women weren't. And then at the end, they were, uh, we're doing our question on Beatrice, isn't that to do with how she's the traditional woman? And then it led to kind of annotating and things. Um, so it's really interesting to see that kind of labelled, because they're my top set, so I wouldn't have approached that necessarily with my lower ability kids. But, you know, they're kids who at the beginning said, we hate Shakespeare, and now they're the kids who are going out going, 
my God, how much of a douchebag is a bit like a Benedict? He has no idea what Beatrice is really thinking. And suddenly you hear them in the corridors <laughs> saying, oh God, you're such a Benedict today. And it's the most bizarre <laughs> thing to hear. Um, so yeah, it's interesting to see it kind of labelled and how it can be. Yeah, yeah. And, and it's at, I have to say, going back, and I never did this as a teacher. I'm doing it because I'm doing a study guide on Romeo and Juliet. Looking at the literary criticism of Romeo and Juliet, the modern stuff, Catherine Belsky on Romeo and Juliet, it's fantastic. It's amazing. So energising. And I've just been dealing with very kind of sedentary editions of Shakespeare, the school's editions, which are just so uh, basic. Now, that is not to say that they have their place. I'm not denying that. But a teacher kind of informing, uh, you know, if you're able to decode some of this stuff, because it's not suitable to give to children, um, uh, Catherine Belsey's essay on love, in Rome, no, the, the ideology of love <laughs> in Romeo and Juliet, but it's certainly some of the ideas you could easily communicate by, you know, praising them for yourself. Um, so, Restless World is there. Um, I can send you all a PowerPoint if you want the links and all of that. Um, okay, uh, yeah. So, Eagleston, again, fantastic definition. Cultural materialist is principally interested in the way material factors like economic conditions, political struggles of all sorts, have influenced or created a text. In turn, they argue any text can tell us about material conditions. So they're studying Shakespeare in a completely different way from the traditionalists. They're not saying this is the great, brilliant, timeless text. They're saying this is a material product of a culture that's really interesting to study. That's what they're saying. They're not going to deny that the poetry is good, though. Yes. I think it's about challenging Shakespeare, isn't it? It's about looking at what's being said and at the time. And obviously, with new historicism, we can't with our brains and our values, then go back in time and judge them for what they believed at the time. But it is about questioning that, because obviously we know that women's subjugation just went on for centuries afterwards. So you can yeah. look at how it was for Jews yeah. to be oppressed and then think, well, okay, what was going on in the 1960s and 70s? And there's some really interesting uh, discussions about how oppressed Juliet actually is and the sort of nature of her sexuality um, in, in, in the kind of modern critical field, which is quite interesting. Rex Gibson approach, so is, now we're moving to the pedagogy of it. Rex, so we've looked at the literary criticism traditions. The pedagogy, I mean, he dominates many of the thoughts, modern thoughts, you know, to see Shakespeare as a drama, to get it acted out. And I just went to a fantastic presentation, I don't know if anyone's there, on I, I, uh, iPad app that's been developed by the University of Bristol and Lorna Smith that's getting students to think about different acted out uh, things and I certainly um, you know if anyone wants to I'm sure Lorna's around but if anyone wasn't there and wants to see Lorna I'll introduce you, you know, later on um, so uh, yeah the, some, the Gibson approach will be doing things like encouraging sword fights, freeze frames, readings with echoes on keywords um, seems to work and it's a repeated idea in many of his uh, texts cartoons for staging, blocking things out, you know, all of these active approaches, which I think perhaps Ellie's, you know, approaches embody most the Gibson approach, you know, um, very much uh, something that he has pioneered. Um, Nate, the Nate Shakespearean is fantastic. Um, they, it's very much know the facts, the teacher tells a story, and they do things like speed trial. So they uh, very quickly tell the story to Macbeth, to the class. Then they go around and see who can tell it quickest without any uh, mistakes. Okay, And the, it's a game, and if you get a mistake, then you have to move another person that tells the story. So you have to go around. Um, then the people audition for mime parts of the play. Okay. Um, and then they mime the story, so you've, you then have a mime version of the story, and then there's a speed trial miming, how, who can do it in a minute, Macbeth in a minute, and then there's a modern English improvisation built onto that, so people have done the mime, they improvise, and then they learn aloud. It's really interesting, um, and it goes into depth in here, that you, people learn aloud key speeches, and they learn them off by heart, um, having rooted themselves in the story, um, first of all, and knowing the characters. And then they create a text for performance. So that's kind of some of the techniques are in there. Um, Shakespeare, our contemporary, is very much about relating it to today. Okay, so you know uh, the the, the Friarian story. So, uh, anyone come across Paolo Friere as a kind of 
much hated philosopher by the right wing, uh, possibly quite, in I think unjustly so actually, um, he's become a bugbear for people like Michael Gove and, uh, because he insists that you should be trying to make everything relevant to people's lives, okay? So looking, you would, with this approach, they, they'd watch modern ad adaptations of the play. They would think about how the play could be come alive, having knowing the plot in modern situations. Um, and uh, you would scaffold it using kind of what's called Vygotsky's ideas of the ZPD, the Zone of Proximal Development. So the, the, the teacher is there to assist the um, you're nodding familiar if you've done all this and teach training. No, uh, it's, yeah. it's me having a silly moment. I've been hearing ZPD uh, for the last year and I have no idea what it meant about just three months. No, you're just real. Yeah, it's, it's about scaffolding, isn't it? It's about you as a teacher, uh, it, and maybe the simplest way to describe it is you will work with someone and you, you will listen to, so you've told them the story to Shakespeare, say, and you'll listen to them tell it back and you say, well, hang on a minute, probably you need to think about this or add in this particular detail. So you as a teacher are there to kind of build up their knowledge in a dialogue. So it's all about that dialogue between pupil and teacher, okay, the Vygotsky zone of proximal development. And Vygotsky has successfully argued this is the way that people learn. You know, they learn through trial and error and listening to someone who knows more than they do to correct them and build on their knowledge, okay. Um, so uh, it offers uh, chances for active learning. A film operates as a scaffold. If uh, and I know Ellie, you were criticising. No, wasn't yeah, criticizing it's fine. Stop. No, no, but yeah, a typical Vygotskyan approach would be actually to show the film, explain the key things, listen to see see who's actually understood things, maybe get them to write a review of it so far in their books, see whether they've got things right or wrong, correct mistakes move on to the next bit. So, and that is a kind of the ZPD in action, just using the film. But, you know, it's, that's one, one way of doing it. Uh, rap is a powerful scaffold. Um, you know, getting people to take what they know of the story and turn it into a rap or a poem. Um, and, uh, but the idea is that it's the opposite of saying, right, of the lecture approach. It's a dialogue, okay? So you're not saying, right, learn this off by heart. Um, and that is something that Friere, with his idea of the banking concept, which is, he was very critical of teachers saying, right, learn this, know this, this is what you have to know, go away, then you've got a test on it. Um, so he's against that sort of approach. Um, okay, uh, so, and what, where Shakespeare has become very oppressive is its prescription, when, when you know, I have to say personally, I find it hard when I'm not allowed to choose what sort of assessment task is suitable. See, obviously, our person <laughs> are suitable for the students. Um, that some stuff might be suitable and others might not be for various students, depending on their ability. So, you know, why can't my question to go from the people running things? Why can't a teacher decide? Right, I'm going to assess this student on the way they acted out this student might be assessed on the essay writing. I saw a fantastic film. Has anyone seen The Blind Side? See, see it, see it. It's a really interesting film with Sandra Bullock, and, uh, American and it's about an American football yeah. player. And it, what I found just blew me away was the American system allowed that, uh, it's about a young black boy who is from an awful background, is adopted by a white family, goes to a, a better school. And this better school, you know, from his awful situation, um, is able, because the American system allows it, to assess him orally, not in a written exam. And actually, it turns out his knowledge is good, but he, can, he can't write anything down. And so he passes the relevant tests um, based for, for his, to get into university because teachers have that flexibility to assess. And what I would say about Shakespeare, what becomes oppressive is when teachers don't have the power to choose the assessment tools. Yeah. I had a, a lower set uh, year 11, and there was two students that really struggled with just writing. And the, when we were doing the play, they were very enthusiastic about the play, knew the play inside out, but the assessment was on critical analysis and the language analysis of the text. 
and they couldn't they couldn't access it. And I think you're exactly right what you're saying. Yes, it's to give that it's to give them some access into it, a different route, because they love the play and they actually got really into it. But it, it couldn't be reflected in the way the narrow the, the restrictions of the assessment procedure. Yeah, and, and it's a huge shame because you know I've taught a child in my current year 11, I'm sure, sadly, he will get a U or a G. I mean, but if you were to test him orally, his understanding was phenomenal. But he is for, on the autistic spectrum, he writes three words in an hour. And particularly in panic-stricken situations, he freezes it. I saw him in GCSE, and he was just shivering with fear. I mean, it was terrifying. And so I feel that, you know, we, the system for us teachers isn't that kind, um, you know, at, at, at this, but perhaps we need to work so, around it. Um, yeah, going, early. Going back to, I said that I taught um, two deaf kids, they were year eight, um, and when, when uh, I mean, I'm not going to profess to be a hearing impaired expert at all, I have been for a year, um, but obviously their language acquisition, you've got one word for happy or one sign for happy or to laugh, and then I was trying to think, well, we've got how many synonyms for, for one particular word, and then you present them with Shakespeare, and they, there are going to be deaf kids and low ability kids um, out there in the world having to access this every year in a short space of time, and that's, that is going to be a challenge. It's going to have to be differentiating it right the way down so that, they, so that their language isn't a problem, but they still get the enjoyment out of what Shakespeare, the story that Shakespeare was telling in the first place. Yeah, thank you, Ellie. I'm so happy, I would have had to fight Claudio. You get me, she likes me. Oh, 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 oh. Leonardo, your niece likes me. Pow, 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 pow. I want to be that girl for the rest of my life. Oh, 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 oh. She likes me. In this scene, I'll be playing the narrator and Leonardo. Harvey will be playing Benedict. Beatrice will be played by Roman. And Sam will be playing Claudio. After Benedict has asked which one of the ladies is Beatrice, she has revealed herself. Oi, what's my name? Why do you need me? Do you love me, babe? Nah, I'm sorry, babe. You've made me lady, yeah? Well, then your family's been lied to. They swore you did. <coughs> Wait, do you love me? Hell no, unless you want me to. Your family's been lying too. They said they swore you loved me. So you don't love me. Love me. Yes, I'm here as a friend. Oh, Beatrice, come on. I'm sure you have something for him. I know. I've got a screen on saying how much Benedict likes Beatrice. Look, <laughs> he even tweeted it. Yeah, no, I just explain, you may, may not be that clear. What I was doing now is modernising Much Ado About Nothing. It's something that I'd perhaps talk about at the beginning of the next session in a bit more detail. But what I did there was, again, um, using some of the Rex Gibson Nate approaches. Firstly, I got, quite like Ellie, doing the, uh, it's got the basics of the story. I have to say, I did use the Branagh film. It's interesting. Um, and I was stopping it. They didn't get on that well with it, though. And it only came alive when I was doing more of the sorts of things that Ellie was suggesting, where I was getting them to, um, I was telling them a story myself, face to face, um, having <laughs> almost learnt it off by heart. Um, because it's quite tricky, uh, you, you know, just you have to kind of know it pretty well, um, don't you? The film starts yeah. with their arse as a side boot. And a load of singing, and as much as I, there's some brilliant YouTube clips, and actually David Tennant is in a modern adaptation yeah. of it, so I've shown them, we only do kind of like two minutes, our lessons have been cut down to 45 minutes, so it's a case of short clips, and I have to admit, I made the mistake of showing them the opening to introduce the characters, um, and I couldn't get the boys back after that much arse, I'm afraid. Yeah, yeah, no, it's not, it w and it didn't work well with me. What worked well with me is this drum approach, where I told them a story, I then, um, so they were then acting out and improvising the story, taking ownership of the story, um, in a, and I went to a drama room for it. So uh, what they had was the plot and the characters. They didn't have the language at that point. Then, and you'll just see, in fact, if you know the play quite well, that scene is actually quite accurate because then I got them with the No Fear Shakespeare um, to look really closely at one scene, which was the Beatrice and Benedict scene, uh, where Beatrice and Benedict are 
deceived into believing that they love each other, um, and then they talk to each other and are aware that they've both been tricked. And that group of boys there, some of whom were quite naughty, actually, I have to say, really got into it. And again, cultural materialist stuff, I contextualised it, that the boys, young boys, would have played women. Um, and that helped, um, and talking about the context there. Uh